Grace be unto you and peace from God our Father and from the Lord Jesus Christ. Welcome, friends. Let us begin with the singing of a, of a, of a song, uh, one verse. Surely the presence of the Lord is in this place. We'll sing it, sing it through twice, the second time a little slower, a little quieter. Surely the presence of the Lord is in this place. I can feel his mighty power and his grace. I can hear the brush of angels' wings. I see glory on each face. Surely the presence of the Lord is in this place. Surely the presence of the Lord is in this place. I can feel his mighty power and his grace. I can fear the brush of angels' wings. I see glory on each face. Surely the presence of the Lord is in this place. Friends, I forgot to make a couple of quick announcements. One is to remind you that that uh, next Sunday will be the first Sunday of, of, of worship in June, and so we will have a virtual communion service. I mentioned this last Sunday, a virtual communion service this coming Sunday, and uh, if you would like to participate in that, I hope you will. Please have something, some bread, cracker, piece of piece of cake, a cookie, uh, something to drink, some juice, uh, some milk, some water, a cup of tea, whatever whatever suits you. Uh, the second announcement is please remember uh, in your thoughts and prayers Chris Tobias, the, the son of, of Becky and Paul Cleveland who's been having some, some rather difficult and, and difficult time uh, with some medical conditions. They haven't been able to, to uh, figure out exactly what it is and Becky would ask you to pray for, Becky and Paul would ask, ask you to pray for Chris. So we will do that. Uh, now I'd like you to bow your heads in prayer with me uh, for an opening prayer. Uh, this is a prayer from St. Francis of Assisi. Let us pray together. Lord, help me to live this day quietly, easily, to lean upon your great strength trustfully, restfully, to wait for the unfolding of your, of your will patiently, serenely, to meet others peacefully, joyously, to face tomorrow confidently, courageously. Amen. Rather than do a, a little Bible study like I've been doing a little meditation, I've got something else on my mind and I wrote a little introduction. I'm going to read someone else's work this day. In the midst of our concerns and fears for ourselves and our loved ones during this deadly outbreak of coronavirus, there is another tragedy unfolding. The death, murders of several African Americans, a tragedy not the only ones, just the most recent ones. It is a line that goes back in this nation before it was a nation to the beginnings of slavery when we were still colonies. Watching, to the, watching the protests and listening to some of the commentaries about the protests has made me think a lot about my, about my privileged life. I didn't really know what or how to say something. I'm still not sure I can do it in my own words. Then last Sunday I received an email from Union Theological Seminary in Richmond, Virginia. Union is one of our Presbyterian denominational seminaries. 
It was a statement from the Reverend Dr. Brian K. Blount, a Presbyterian minister, a scholar and teacher, who is the president of Union, who is African American. His life experiences are, of course, quite different from mine. Yet I felt that he spoke to me and in some sense occasionally for me. So instead of a short meditation on a biblical passage, I'm going to read his statement. It's kind of lengthy. Uh, I also realize that I might not read it with the proper phrasing or emphasis so that it resonates with the meanings that Dr. Blount uh, intended. So I would like, if you, if you would like a copy to read and to think about for yourself, please email me, call me, and I will send you a statement, his statement for you. This came out as a press release from Richmond, Virginia on Sunday, May 31st, 2020. It begins, the following statement was made by Union, Pres Union Presbyterian Seminary President Brian K. Blount on the death of George Floyd, a black man who died Monday, May 25th, 2020, after a white Minneapolis police officer pressed his knee on his neck until he stopped breathing, and nationwide protests over police mistreatment of African Americans. It begins with a scripture from the book of Revelation, from chapter 12, verse 11. And they conquered evil by the blood of the Lamb, and the word of their witness. If white Christians were to ask me, a black Christian, what they should do in response to the spiral of racially sparked violence into which we are rapidly and inevitably descending, I have pondered the response I would give. Strange since no one has asked that I nonetheless feel compelled to answer. I feel compelled because I am afraid. I am afraid because I fear that my voice is too insignificant to matter. I am afraid because I fear that while what I say bears insufficient weight to make a difference, it carries just enough potency to get me in trouble. I am afraid because I fear bringing trouble on myself when my people are writhing in a perpetual abyss of systemic injustice. I am afraid because I fear that one day, long after I have died, my son and daughter will still weep at news about a black individual murdered while sitting in her, in her home, running in his community, walking home from his corner store, driving in her car, standing in his front yard, exploring in his park, worshiping in her church lying helpless on an American street, the full weight of a cavalier, almost casual, curiously disinterested white anger crushing his throat beneath its self-righteous, imperious knee. I am afraid because I fear a reckoning on the streets if we cannot find justice in the courts, redress in our politics, realignment of our institutional policies, and reconsideration of our racial values. I am afraid because I fear that when I am called to my own final reckoning, the record will show that I didn't do my part. I didn't witness. Not enough. White Christians are not witnessing. Not enough. In the Apocalypse, the book of Revelation, the world is possessed by systemic evil. That evil manifested itself in an imperial reign that demanded a fealty the Apocalypse's author claimed to belong solely to Christ. Rome wanted to be worshipped. Christ believers could respond in one of two ways. They could patriotically idealize, idolize Rome. They could patriotically idolize Rome or they could witness to the Lordship of Christ, either or. Rome, Rome promised to punish anyone who refused to render the reverence it believed it was due. Writing to seven churches located in the belly of this imperial, bestial declaration of religious and political supremacy, John of Patmos pleaded for a witness to an alternative truth. 
the only leader who deserved fidelity and worship was this Jesus who died on a Roman cross. It was not Rome's empire, but his resurrected reign that should be revered and realized. He spilled his blood in an effort to inaugurate that reign. He did his part. Our Christian witness, our Christian part, our Christian part is to witness to that reign in a way we speak with our words and live our lives. It is our formula for reckoning with systemic evil that possesses institutions and drives individuals mad. The blood of Christ, the witness of the Lamb's followers, us black and you white Christians. What does the reign, what does a reign under the Lordship of Christ look like? Before we can witness for it, we must know what it is. If we could see into God's future the way John saw through his open door into transcendence, perhaps we would know. We are not that far-sighted, but our hindsight ought to be 2020, because it is written in a record for us. If Jesus of Nazareth, Nazareth is, the, is the Christ of the apocalypse, then we have a glimpse of what a reign under his rule would look like. We have something for which to witness. In the gospel vision, there lepers are touched. There are no Eric Garners who cannot breathe. There the sick are unilaterally healed. There are no Ahmed Aubrey's demonically hunted to death. There codes and laws too legalistically and unjustly applied are broken. There are no Brianna Taylors shot eight times when their homes are broken into by law enforcement. There, men once incapacitated by paralysis walk. There are no George Floyds paralyzed beneath the weight of ruthless state agents. Their systems of ethnic segregation are broken open by a vision of a house of prayer for all the nations. There is no aspiration of a rule where one people structure society so that it perpetually privileges them and those like them. We know from hindsight the promise of Jesus' vision. We know what it intends. Our, our calling is to witness to it, no matter the cross. I am afraid because I know I'm not witnessing, not enough. I am afraid because I know that white Christians are not witnessing, not enough. Why does our country need white Christians to witness more than they are? More, even, more now even than black Christians and black people of every faith and of no faith? Whether it's individual acts of brutality or systemic oppression, it's hard to maneuver maneuver successfully for change when your hands are shackled, your legs are taken out from beneath you, and someone is kneeling on your neck. You need the people who wield economic, political, police, and military power to rein in the agents they have authorized to act on their behalf, to rein down change upon the systems their forebears have spent centuries erecting to privilege themselves. You need them to witness, not just spiritually, tangibly, not just with well-intentioned prayer, with concrete action, not just from the pulpit and in the sanctuary, out in the world, on the streets of their cities, in the corridors of their power. No, this evil of enduring American racism is not just a Christian problem. But for a people who claim to follow a Jesus who died on a cross for all people and whom we claim reigns in heaven interceding with God for all people, it is an evil we must especially engage. We cannot claim to witness to this risen Christ and simultaneously allow our country's descent into this racial abyss. We Christian people can make a difference. 
We must help defeat this draconian systemic evil by our witness before it is too late. Now let us bow our heads in prayer. Heavenly Father, we, we pause in our day at this time to offer our prayers, prayers for those who need your healing power and your care, who need your wholeness and your presence in their lives especially in these difficult times. Lord, we pray for those especially who are hospitalized, some with a deadly disease, some of other lesser illnesses, some of other illnesses which are just as deadly and dangerous. Lord, we lift up to you, Chris, in this time and hold him before you and pray with his family for his for his healing and for his care Lord help him to know and help all those that we lift up to know that you are with him that you are with them that you comfort and care and support and love them God, our Heavenly Father, we draw near to you with thankful hearts because of all your great love for us. We thank you most of all for the gift of your dear Son, in whom alone we may become one. We are different one from another in race and often in culture and experience, in material things, in gifts, in opportunities. But each of us has a human heart, knowing joy and sorrow, pleasure and pain. We are one in our need for your forgiveness, for your strength, for your love. Make us one in our common response to you, that bound by a common love and freed from selfish aims, we may, may work for the good of all races and all peoples and for the advancement of your kingdom. Through Jesus Christ our Lord we pray, who taught us to pray together. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but to...